Hi, welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Abbasi. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and stroke survivor. <clears throat> welcome. And I already said that. <laughs> welcome again, like super welcome today. Um, okay, so before we get to the main topic of the podcast episode today, I wanted to introduce the listener challenge for March, and that is the Serenity Prayer Daily Reflection. So this is what we're going to do. This month, you are invited to recite the Serenity Prayer every day and reflect on your day with that in mind apply the serenity prayer to whatever circumstances, challenges, or joys that you have encountered that day. So how do the prayer's themes of serenity, acceptance, courage, and wisdom manifest in your life on a daily basis? To aid in this exploration, I'm an overachiever. We all know that by now. So I will be offering 30 writing prompts, one each day at the beginning of the episode, designed to spark introspection and illuminate the various facets of your recovery, you know, on a daily basis. These prompts are meant to encourage you to write about your feelings and identify moments of acceptance, recognize when you've summoned summoned courage, and articulate what serenity means to you. So, good? That's what we're doing, the Serenity Prayer Daily Reflection. And what I'm hoping at the end of this month, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a habit. Um, When I first got into sobriety, this is something that I had in front of me all the time. I put it all around me and I just kept repeating it to my, and I needed to repeat it to myself constantly. So I am trying to encourage that in you as well. Um, So that's what we're going to do. So today, um, your writing prompt is the following. How did reciting the serenity prayer today change your perspective on a challenging situation? So you can either wake up and and, uh, recite the serenity prayer. You can do it when you're in the bathroom. You can write it, you know, with with some lipstick on your mirror, however you choose to do it. You just want to read it thoughtfully at least once during the day and then journal. Um, It doesn't have to be a long journal entry or anything, but just jot down how reciting the serenity prayer today changed your perspective on a challenging situation. That's it. Easy enough and very, very worth doing. So I'm looking forward to, um, to hearing how this new challenge affects your, your, uh, your mindset. Okay, so today I'm going to be extending a bit more on the vestibular conference that I'm attending. So today uh, there was a presentation that was focused on vestibular migraine, PPPD, which they also call triple PD, (laughs) and uh, central vestibular disorders. Um, the, the virtual vestibular conference is called Life Rebalanced Live 2024. Um, so I'm going to do this a little differently. Usually I spend a lot of time throughout the day writing out my script. I have notes that I take and then I write out the script. 
Today, I didn't write out the script. I just have all my notes. So we'll see if I'm all over the place or not. Bear with me. Uh, maybe this will be a whole new way of doing the, the episode. I have a feeling I'm going to say um a lot more. Um, that See, I just did. <laughs> That's why I write my script out. So I apologize in advance if my ums drive you crazy. Here we go. So this is what I've learned today. It was so educational. And just to uh, just uh, preface all of this, I have not yet been diagnosed with a vestibular disorder, but I am telling you, everything is resonating me with me, what these people are saying. And I told my husband this today, and he's like, oh, here we go. First it was, <laughs> first it was going to the vision therapist after I went to the ophthalmologist, and they were like, I was telling the lady, the vision therapist, like what I was dealing with, and the lady w- was like responding to me with just the perfect words, like she totally understood what I was feeling, and yet that's not what was wrong with me. So, um, Anyway, he's like, why don't we just wait until we get a diagnosis before you go down this road? But um, regardless, I'm learning a lot about vestibular disorders, and I want to share that knowledge. Um, it's not going to do do uh, anyone any you know good if I'm just sitting here keeping all of this fantastic information to myself. So I wanted to share it. So Vestib- your vestibular system is your balance system. And there are two types, I guess, of vestibular disorders, two flavors, if you will. There's a central vestibular disorder and peripheral uh, vestibular disorder. And um, one has to do with the organs in your ears. It's weird. I didn't know we had organs in our ears, but there's a whole bunch of tiny little organs in our ears. And um, the other is, uh, well, deals with the components in your brain. So I'm going to be talking about the components in the brain. And this is, uh, there's a little bit of self-diagnosis happening here, but it's fine. It's fine. I can do whatever I want. It's my podcast. So um, I'm just going to share with you my experience and how this, re- since you guys are um, keeping up with my recovery, it's this is real time like when, you know, eight months ago, and I didn't know what the hell was wrong with me, and now we're going in this direction of vestibular disorder. So um, it's really, I think a demonstration of how difficult it is to, this all started with a stroke, you know, this all started with a stroke, how difficult it is to go to like all these different specialists and, and have prescribed all these different medications. And yet nobody even knows what's wrong with me yet. So um, there is a certain level of advocacy, I guess, for myself that requires me to do this kind of research. And I talked to my psychiatrist about about this, you know, it's not my job to diagnose myself. It's not, but I think that there's a very gray line between how far I need to go to research the topic in order to get myself to the right specialist so that they can diagnose me. And I go all the way, you know, I've gotten all the way to the point where all I need is a vestibular examination, a vestibular system examination, and then I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm diagnosed. So laugh if you will, but that's what I, um, I've been having to do here. So, okay, so What they were talking about are some of the symptoms that are correlated with central vestibular disorders. Um, One thing that I think is very interesting, I think I've mentioned this, but I'm going to mention it again, is that 
In my third MRI, the one that I just had that was on my ears, um, they did not see anything wrong with my hearing system. Um, but they did note that I have severe TMJ. And another thing that they noted was that the min- the infarcts, the mini strokes in the back in my cerebellum were more, quote unquote, conspicuous than they were in the previous MRI. So I've had three MRIs. Um, so just something to keep in mind here, because what research I had seen is that these mini strokes in the cerebellum are ex- often correlated to vestibular disorders. So this is the, these little tiny infarcts, I don't like that word, <laughs> the mini strokes in the cerebellum, these are the things that, there's two of them um, that I know of, that the neurologist said, no, there's no way that has anything to do with your symptoms. They're too small. But if you go online, I know it's dangerous to do that, but it talks about how tiny, tiny, these tiny, tiny little infarcts in your cerebellum can cause major vestibular problems, major symptoms. So anyway, the information is there. So take it or leave it. I That's what I'm suspicious of right now. And um, I can't just discount that the way that the neurologist did, especially when I'm reading it right in front of me. And it's not just one resource that's saying this. I'm seeing it all over the place that these uh, can be the cause of vestibular disorders. Now, what I experience today in this conference is that there are so many different causes for vestibular disorders. In fact, there was one guy who said, I couldn't even believe it. This one guy said that he smoked pot and ever since then, he was never the same, that he started having a vestibular disorder. So what in the world happened with him? You know, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. I think that the research in this area is still very new. Of course, why would I get a disorder that is well known? You know, of course, I would get something that's like, it's a it's a unseen illness, you know. Um, So anyway, lots of different reasons that people get vestibular disorders. There's strokes, there's, um, there's, uh, some people it's, it's just, uh, in their genes or something like that. I I don't know. There's lots of them. I I think I may have written down some of those. I'm not sure. We'll see if I get there. Um, Okay, so they talked about, first they talked about vestibular migraines. Um, So they talked about how the test, the vestibular exam by the otolaryngologist is more reliable than an MRI. That's what, uh, there was an otolaryngologist that was talking. She was the one presenting. So knowledgeable. It was just amazing. And she was talking about how the diagnosis of a vestibular migraine is based on the conversation that the patient has with the doctor and the, the vestibular exam. There is no direct test to say, yes, you have a vestibular migraine. It is, um, 
checking off boxes and saying, well, you don't have that, you don't have that, you don't have that. Um, so, but she said that they trust the exam more than they trust an MRI. So I thought that was interesting as well, because we're talking about this MRI and the mini strokes in my cerebellum. So uh, I'll talk more about vestibular migraines and some of the symptoms that people shared or that this, uh, so it started out from noon to one, there was a doctor that talked, uh, presented, and then from one to two, there were uh, several patients that shared about their experience. And you know, I love people telling their story. So um, I'll talk more about what happened, um, what they shared with the symptoms and such. But another piece of this that they shared is uh, PPPD. And at the moment, I can't remember what that stands for, but I will see if I can find it in my notes. Um, And let's see. Oh, it's called persistent postural perceptual dizziness. So if you break down those words, um, what does that mean, right? Persistent means it happens uh, all the time. Postural means it happens more when you're standing up or moving. Uh, Perceptual, I think it means you're creating something that isn't really there, meaning you're seeing movement, but it's not really happening. And dizziness. So or it's not exactly just movement. Some people have rocking. Some people have floating. All kinds of different you know, some people have jiggling, so whatever their perception is of what they see. And it lasts more than 90 days and are exacerbated, excuse me, by positions such as sitting upright, standing, or walking, and being visually, in visually complex, uh, like, environments. Like the grocery store, lots of people say the grocery store is hard for them um, and that kind of thing. Like uh, New York City streets would be terrible. (laughs) There are uh, folks that talked about flying, like traveling is really difficult. So there's a lady who talked about um, asking for, like she requests the wheelchair service in airports because it's so difficult for her to, um, I guess, visually ingest her environment in an airport. So she gets wheeled there and keeps her eyes closed. So that sounds like something that I would need to do. Um, So testing and imaging for this are unremarkable, meaning there's just there aren't, uh, like I said, MRIs aren't really going to show what is going on in there. And so the treatment is usually cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy. There's also medications that folks were talking about, like um, anti-anxiety depression medication, which I think is because it brings down your blood pressure. And I think the anxiety, a lot of people were talking about how anxiety and stress exacerbate the problems too. So um, anyway, that's kind of a summary of of what that is. Uh, Folks, so, okay, so some of the symptoms people were also talking about um, is this extra sensitivity to sound. There was a lot of talk about hypersensitivity to motion, and that is the thing that I'm dealing with, is anything that moves. Um, But also this extra sensitivity to sound. I have found that when I'm doing my podcast, I actually, my symptoms start getting worse 
by listening to the my voice, <laughs> which makes me want to laugh. Like I'm causing myself to be sick. But uh, just having conversations with somebody, um, my symptoms will start to increase as I'm talking. So like talking on the phone, doing this podcast, just the, the loudness of my own voice in my ears will cause my dizziness to start acting up. Strange, I know. Um, but I was, I was outside. I was letting the dogs out last night. And I was thinking, I don't know if I'm getting worse. I certainly am not getting any better. But I started thinking, am I getting worse? I'm, I'm not sure. It's odd. It's kind of odd, but I'm just putting that out there. So they talked about uh, brain fog. So brain fog is something that you all know that I have dealt with also. Um, I ended up going to a neuropsychiatrist because it was getting to the point where I was a danger to our household because I was leaving things on and really forgetful. But then in addition to that, I was having problems finding words. I say was, I still am. But it was really at a bad point there for a while. And it comes and it goes depending on how bad I'm feeling in my head. So I was diagnosed with mild cognitive disorder in speech and language. That's what I was diagnosed with at the neuropsychiatrist. Um, interestingly enough, the folks, the doctor, the otolaryngologist that was presenting today talked about how brain fog develops from this vestibular disorder. And it really is because we are, you know, normally we rely without even thinking about it on our balance system, on our vestibular system. So we don't really have to think about it. And when we develop this lack of ability to rely on our balance system because we're dizzy constantly, our brain is working harder um, to because it's in protection mode. You know, it's it doesn't want to feel that way. So it's it's per- making sure like at any moment you're not going to fall over or so it's working harder and for it to work harder at that it has to sacrifice cognitive processes that are easier to access you know and those are things like word finding and memory it's a bandwidth problem is what the doctor was talking about Um, But it's not permanent. It comes and it goes. So I'm telling you, everything that I heard today was just like, yes, that's me. That's me. That's me. Um, They were talking about how sometimes conversations will cause symptoms to increase. And um, they were talking about patterns and lights and... Um, I've mentioned before, like when I'm looking out a window that has blinds on it, I think I talked about this yesterday because I couldn't think of the word blinds. It will be, it will be really difficult for m- me to look at it. Um, and it hurts my head and makes me feel this dizzy feeling. And um, because it's a pattern, a light and dark pattern. I've also been in like a coffee shop that has like striped wallpaper or painting on the wall. Oh, it's terrible. I can't look at repeated patterns like that. Um, it, it straight up makes me want to vomit. 
Like, it's really terrible. It's it's unbelievable to hear myself say that, but that's what it feels like. And um, things like getting excited. So I talked about the stress and the anxiety that can exacerbate the problem. Well, that's also positive stress. You know, we have negative stress. That's the one we talk about all the time. But there's this positive when we get really excited. And I remember when, um, I guess it was probably about six to eight months ago when this all started, when people would start coming over to see me, I would get really excited and it would make my symptoms worse. So that's the same thing. And they were talking about that. Um, They were talking about the fatigue and that's both physical fatigue because everything, your brain is working so much harder to do everything and um, psychiatric fatigue And um, I just wrote down hot flashes because I'm telling you I have a hot flash like every freaking five minutes, it feels like. So the doctor talked about how this um, vestibular dysfunction is a chronic medical condition. And when somebody comes in gets diagnosed, and then begins treatment, their goal is to reduce symptoms by 50%. Um, That's what I heard that is like, of course, they aim to do more, but that is the goal. That is what success looks like, um, is what it sounded like the doctor said. And they said, she said, like, it's about six to eight months of this therapy, like vestibular therapy, that um, about six to eight months where they can achieve about a 50% reduction in symptoms. So um, I have not, you know, I started doing that vision therapy, but it just didn't seem right. I, I wasn't satisfied that I was accurately diagnosed, and that's why I stopped doing it. I have no idea really what this uh, cognitive behavioral and physical therapy, vestibular therapy is like, but I will look into that a little more to find out. But um, once the doctor was done talking, there were a few patients that came on and were talking about their experience. So uh, one was the guy who got it after he smoked pot. And then another young woman, she had migraines her whole life and then developed a vestibular disorder. So I'm not quite sure. She did She did say something particular happened, but I can't remember what it was. So they were talking about what are the different um, treatments that they have tried over the years. And prior to being diagnosed with a vestibular disorder, with, with vestibular migraine and triple PD, Uh, Those are the ones that I'm mostly focused on here because they are the ones that I identify with. But they talked about prior to being diagnosed, which it took them at least two years to be diagnosed, at least, by going to multiple doctors, just like I did. Um, so far, neurologist, ophthalmologist, neuro ophthalmologist, um, optometrist, uh, psychiatrist, all of these things. Um, so same thing. It seems like I'm on the same path. And they tried uh, Western medicine and also tried some of these all other alternative medicines. So 
They've tried Botox therapy, migraine medication, massage, uh, sleep routines, um, all of these things. And it wasn't until they got associated with this VITA uh, organization, Vestibular Disorder Association, I believe. Sorry, I should know that for sure. Um, but they, uh, I'm looking it up, <laughs> Vestibular Disorders Association, it's V-E-D-A for anyone who's interested. I know I've already connected with somebody online last night who um, also has vestibular disorder uh, issues. So um, anyway, they got connected with this VITA organization, and we're finally put in touch with the correct uh, clinicians that could uh, provide a diagnosis, an accurate diagnosis, and then start working towards therapy and uh, combination. One guy said he takes like a combination of three different medications in order to be able to work five hours a day. Honestly, in my situation, I can't even fathom working. Like, I I can't even imagine these people are working under this condition. So um, there's people that I've uh, connected with, or, or I haven't connected with them, but I've read some messages on the community forum about people who are just in the process of recognizing, I guess, acknowledging that they cannot keep working. And it sounds like that is normal, that people try as hard as they can to keep working until they just can't do it anymore. And that's what I did. I mean, I didn't know that this is what was wrong with me. And again, I still don't know if this is what's wrong with me. But um, but I did that whole denial thing. I just kept pushing until I couldn't push anymore. There was another lady who uh, was a patient, is a patient, and she was wearing some red glasses, and those were called Theraspecs, T-H-E-R-A-S-P-E-C-S, Um, There's indoor and outdoor versions, and these are kind of like your blue light glasses that people wear for computers, only they're also uh, intended for people with migraines and vestibular disorders. So it really cuts down a lot more of the light and that kind of thing. Um, they're a little more expensive. I looked them up online. They're like 100 to $150 per pair. So I'm going to actually wait and see if this is what's wrong with me just before I start forking out any money. Um, she also mentioned using walking poles. I don't ever feel, I don't ever expose myself to that much walking that I'm actually going to fall over. I don't see, feel like that's very healthy. So I don't think that walking poles is a necessity to me. But um, also wheelchair assistance. It seems like these people are pushing themselves through life. They must be miserable. I just can't even imagine. Um, so on that note this man, I really appreciated his honesty because he was talking about how I feel. And that is that sometimes, and I'm sure everybody can relate to this, no matter what is going on in your life, sometimes you just want to articulate how hard life is for you, right? That really resonated with me. Um, Not necessarily, well, you know, when I first got sober, 
I started receiving my chip, you know, my chip, my 30-day chip, my two-month chip, and we receive them until we're a year sober, and then you get a chip for 18 months, and then you get a chip every year. And receiving that chip was like a big deal. It was like acknowledgement that, yes, life is hard for you, Rachel, and you've done it. You've achieved it. Keep going. Well done. And then after a while, the chip is not necessary every month. It's something that I understand that I'm living like a normal person now, you know, not normal people don't get a chip every time they get, finish a month, you know, but um, in the beginning, it was so important to me. I needed acknowledgement for how hard I was working. Um, that's what it was like for me. And I can imagine when this guy said this, I thought, he needs a chip. You know, he needs a chip. He needs somebody to tell him, I know life is hard for you and you're working really hard, but well done. You're doing it. Um, that's what I heard in his voice. So he said, over time, he's learned to suppress the need to perform his suffering. And instead of letting the self-pity or the, the need to perform that suffering keep uh, spiraling out of control, he just acknowledges it and moves forward. So he has found that now the most helpful thing for him is to articulate his boundaries to others. So instead of like just doing, you know, knowing that it's gonna, he's gonna suffer, but doing it anyway, which who does that sound like? Now he articulates his boundaries to others he talks about what he can endure and what he can't. And I thought that, um, you know, that's something that I'm still challenged with, but I'm learning. And he said he's not perfect. Like he's still learning how to do that. But he said his son, he has two sons. He said his sons now are even aware of what he can endure and what he can't. So um, if they have an activity that is in a place that has a lot of complex, complex visual and sound stimuli, he can't go that he um, he's going to have to have uh, somebody else drive them, drive them to the uh, to the place. So I thought that that was um, really good advice. And uh, the woman who wears these these glasses, she also talked a lot about sleep and how important sleep routine is. Having less shame about limitations. Um, they talked about being consistent. Once you're learning your own boundaries, being consistent and... Um, sticking to them, you know, so I think there's a lot of self-love that requires a lot of self-love to um, be like, nope, you can't do it. Like what would, if you were a child, how would you take care of yourself? You know, um, you would not push the boundaries as much as you do with yourself. So um, another thing that they talked about was how everyone has advice. And I thought that that was funny. I actually laughed out loud, even though nobody could hear me. Hear me. Um, they were talking about how people are like, you, oh, you're dizzy? Uh, are you getting enough sugar in your body? Like, are you eating enough? 
Um, maybe you need to drink less caffeine. Are you drinking enough water? You know, and these people are like, you have no idea. Like you don't understand it. It doesn't have anything to do with what I'm eating or anything like that. Like it's something in my brain and man, I can identify with that 100%. I have had so many people tell me about these different recommendations for what to do. And I keep saying, no, not yet. I'm not doing that yet. I need to get um, diagnosed before I keep try to cover up the symptoms. I need to find out what is actually wrong with me. And I'm telling you, it's not something as simple as Uh, what I'm eating or what I'm drinking. Now, there are things that I may drink or eat that exacerbate the problem, and that I'm trying to keep under control. Um, But also the sleep thing uh, is important as well. So they talked about having gratitude for the growth that they've had due to their vestibular dysfunction. I thought that that was interesting. Um, They talked about having a flexible schedule. So um, not planning too much. And that allows you to make sure that you can change your agenda for the day based on how you feel. Now, some people who are trying to push through all of this and not, you know, aren't able to listen to their bodies because they're just still working full time and stuff like that. They don't have the flexibility. So um, I do. Thank God. Uh, Let's see. They talked about... um, how challenging it is to explain what is wrong with you. Like saying words like being dizzy or um, that kind of thing. It's, it's such a different feeling and different symptoms that you're experiencing. It's so hard to explain it to somebody. So I could really um, identify with that, that issue as well. So these were the the pieces of advice that they closed out the the um, session with. Number one, don't um, don't correlate a doctor's certainty uh, with the absolute of your future. Meaning, if the doctor says, I know exactly what's wrong and I've got a cure for you. (laughs) That might not necessarily be true. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if the doctor says, you're not going to improve, you're going to deal with this for the rest of your life, that also might not be the case. Um, You could be experiencing 50% less of your symptoms or something. So, Be your own advocate and travel to meet specialists if necessary was what I heard. Another uh, recommendation, don't underestimate the loneliness and isolation affiliated with chronic illness, right? Heard. Um, That's something that I've been suffering with quite a bit. And number three, uh, well, this is kind of affiliated with the first one. Keep advocating for yourself and seeking quality of life. And another thing that um, that I heard was that this woman, she this is how she closed it out. She said, I got to the point where I felt like doctors didn't even care. Um and acted like I'm not even worth saving. Like my life isn't worth improving or getting better. Like she just would get so angry. And she said that it ended up fueling her determination 
And she said, I just want anybody to know that has a vestibular disorder that you're worth, you're worth it. Um, invest in your own self-love. And it's tough, but you will emerge from your dark place. I thought it was interesting that she said that in the very end. You know, I'm always talking about my dark place, right? So, um, so there you have it. She was talking directly to me, folks. Thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.